Well, hello there and welcome to my first interview on radio this year. I'm Jack Lucas Caffrey and today my guest is none other than the singer of the classic Sonic R soundtrack and many other songs that you're about to find out right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome TJ Davis. How are you doing today? Hello, how are you? Very good, very good. I'm happy that you're here and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be back on radio after so many months. <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, the first question I'd like to ask you today, and it's one I always ask to uh, every musician, and that is, uh, how did you actually get into music? Um, it's all I ever wanted to do. Um, I, I, when I was younger, I just wanted to sing. I was uh, living up north, went to music college. I decided the best place for me to be was down in London. Um, got down in London with my um, partner at the time and he was we were writing music together um, and we just started trying to get gigs in London um, I went to every audition going everywhere just to get my sort of foot in the door and um, got to know people and I think that's that's one of the main things there were so many different things going on in London with live music um, and that's all I ever wanted to do and I just started working with lots of different bands um, um, and yeah, it just really went from there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I can tell why you wanted to move to London because I know at around the time, like in the late 80s, early 90s, like gigs were everywhere. Anyone could really go and get a gig once you were good enough. Well, there was, there was a fantastic handbook called um, The Musician's Gig Guide to London and with for new up and coming bands. And, you know, we got a band together and we were writing our own stuff. and. Um, it was it was like a little Bible that every musician had just letting you know which which venues were looking for musicians, which ones did the uh, awful the pay to play thing where sorry, the venues did where, you know, a band would turn up and say, well, you've got to pay for a bit towards the PA. But then you get a bit of a ticket sale at the door, which the Musicians Union were trying to ban at the time. Yeah. Um, but it was it was one of those things. And that's how we got to know people. I got to know other musicians and. And then it sort of went from there, really being asked to sort of do, you know, backing vocals on something. Or um, I went to, I went to even West End auditions as well, because I just wanted to know more about the music industry and ended up with the West End thing. I ended up pop side, pop and rock side rather than going that way in the end. So but it was good. It was all really good experience for me. And like you say, there were a lot of gigs at the time. There isn't so many venues these days unfortunately oh yeah which is which is a shame because it makes it harder for a lot of newer musicians to to break you know i, I was yeah. it's even the Absolutely. same in ireland because like i was speaking to um a musician here named john graham and he was saying the same thing he was going that the, there's so little venues now there's so little places for yeah. people to gig yeah well that's the problem isn't it really and um everything's sort of I don't know, going online and people, you know, even recording stuff at home, it's fantastic that everybody can do their own music, but then they need the places to come out and and do and, and be able to perform as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But you have managed to do that. You have managed to perform on stage many times. Uh, one of the uh, first, like, sort of earlier performances you did, you were a backing vocalist, I believe, for Gary Newman, of all people. So what was it like uh, being a backing vocalist for him? That was my first big gig, actually. Um, oh, oh, it was amazing. I think they always say your, your first tour is the best. Um, and um, I, oh, I, I've i done great. I, I've been very lucky. I've done lots and lots of touring and everything. But I cried when that tour was over. <laughs> <laughs> I just had such I had such a great time. I just uh, the band, the crew and um, the fans at the gigs, you know, Gary's got such a massive following. And he also just, we were doing quite a long show every night and, you know, some of the songs didn't have backing vocals on and Gary was very much like, just do whatever you want to do. And he'd let me run around the stage and give me a tambourine, which a lot of the time was out of time. I <laughs> say that right now. Um, but I just had such a good time with him and I, I met him and I met up with him recently, actually. He was over in, uh, he was over in London and um, I lived down south and he was down here for a few days, him and his wife. And it was really nice to see him because I haven't seen him for ages. So that was really good. Awesome. And uh, how, how is he actually? How is he doing uh, these days? Oh, gosh, he's amazing. He's got um, he's doing a tour over in America starting very soon. 
um he's working on a new album they you know his career is still you know the amount of stuff that he's still doing he's got a fabulous new producer and um yeah he's doing stuff all the time his his last couple of albums were so critically acclaimed everywhere you know so yeah no he's good yeah, that's good to hear. That's good to hear that he's still uh, out about and doing stuff. And uh, another bit of uh, backing vocaling, that, uh, vocal work that you did uh, was actually for a pretty big band, actually. Uh, it was Blur, and it was on the song The Universal on one of their, yes. one of their albums back in the 90s. So like, what was it like working with you know, one of the biggest British bands of the time? Well, it was funny, actually. I mean, I, I've told this story a couple of times that I, when I got the call at home, I thought it was a mate messing about because I was I was doing quite a, a bit of stuff at the time. But obviously, Blur at that point were massive. They were just number, you know, they were right up there. And I got this call from somebody saying, um, are you available to do a session for Blur um, for a song on the new album? And I just played along with it. I sort of went, yeah, sure, and sort of laughed and... <laughs> And then put the phone down and um, then this friend who'd recommended me rang me later and said, did you get the call from the producer about the Blur song? And I, I said, oh, you're joking. I thought it, I thought it was a joke. I thought, and I, I didn't say, oh, don't be silly, don't be daft, didn't put the phone down. Um, but I then thought, oh, my gosh, have I blown it? Uh, thankfully, they did ring back and they booked me and my um, uh, singer friend, Angela Brooks, um, and we both uh, went in to do the Universal. We just did the one song. We were literally in the studio for about an hour, and that was it. Damon knew exactly what he wanted, how he wanted it to sound, what he wanted us to sing, and then we were done. It was like, oh, hello, bye. And that was it. <laughs> and it still gets, like, airplay to this day, and some people even remember it. Like, I was playing it to a few people, and they're like, oh, God, I remember that song. And everything. So, what what does it feel like to be like a part of like, you know, one of Blur's like top ten big tunes? Do you know? It. Do you know what it's because it, it's a great song as well. It, it's such a fact. It's been used on adverts. It's used on everything. When they just um, they announced their new um, uh, tour, they're doing some gigs, aren't they? Soon they're getting back together to do some shows, and they advertise the show with that song so it does feel great it really does because you know it's a part of all that time with Britpop with you know around about 95 wasn't it um it was just a great time for music oh yeah it totally was totally was but despite doing a big gig like Blur and appearing on one of their big songs that's not the thing that apparently people really know you for the most I tend to find that the thing people know you for most is singing on the Sonic R soundtrack. So it's a game <laughs> It's a game I've played before. It's a franchise I love a lot, and I've interviewed many people who worked on the franchise before. So I'd love to know, how did you actually get onto the Sonic R soundtrack? Well, I was at the time working, and I still am actually, because we're back together and we're doing some gigs, but the band D-Ream, mm. um, which obviously Irish, Peter's from Ireland. Yep. Um, and um, I was with them, and the percussionist's girlfriend said to me, um, I've got a friend of mine who I went to university with who's working, who now works for Sega, and he's looking for a singer to demo a song um, for a new um, gaming uh, game. And he, she said, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure. I didn't know anything about the gaming industry at all. I hadn't really done, you know, anything at all. And uh, anyway, he we got in touch. He sent me a tape, old cassette tape, <laughs> of um, Supersonic Racing. Um, and I thought, wow, I've not really done it. It was really sort of quite hard, you know, like Euro, that Euro sort of beat, dancey beat. And um, I, uh, I said, yes, I'll come do a re recording. And I didn't actually know whether it was only going to be that one song, whether they were going to be. He played it to the bosses at Sega they loved it they said let's do an album let's do the whole thing so it was a, a great thing for me to get as well because you know i was i was busy um doing lots of live work with dream at the time we were really busy because off the back of obviously things can only get better and that was riding high we'd done loads of tours but to also be able to do live work and then get in the studio as well was was really good 
And then we went into uh, Metropolis Studios and just recorded the whole album. I think we'd done it. I mean, Rich had already done an awful lot of the um, the music. Um, and then I went in and we just did it over a week. We tried to do a song a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was it was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. That was we had such a good time doing that. Yeah, yeah. And as you mentioned, it took like it was like a song a day sort of thing. So how long did it actually take you to put the whole um, to do all your vocals? Because like when the Supersonic Racing song came out, that was in around E3 of 1997. And then when the game came out, it was around like the holiday season of 1997. So how long was it uh, doing all that music? What, what sort of time space were you two given? Gosh, um, from what I remember, I think we had all the vocals and everything else pretty much done and dusted. It would have been just over a week or a couple of weeks. Um, and then obviously you've got then got mastering and everything else that that's then nothing to do with me. I've done my bit. I can go home. Um, but I used to I remember because I kept going back into the studio because I loved being in there with everybody and I just listened to all the mixes and, and stuff. I also did the little um, voiceover bits, you know, the go, go, go. And I was and just about stuff. to ask you about that because I was wondering, <laughs> I was about to say to you, oh, were you the person that's there? I was because I just played the game like last night to just play over it and kind of remind myself of it. I remember hearing a voice saying, ready, set, go. And I was going, yeah, was that you? <laughs> yes and also as well because I'm from up north I'm from Leeds um I remember they wanted it more like saying dance dance or dance dance and I kept saying dance and they're going oh no you're gonna have to do that again and I'm, yeah yes, that's how I say it <laughs> um but yeah no it was really good it was fabulous working with Richard Jakes he's just a genius he's so good yeah, and so good that he's actually just got like nominated for a Grammy Award this year for the, the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack that he did. I know, I know, I know. We we keep talking about, you know, doing something. What what I'd love to do is do a live concert of the songs. And so we have actually talked about doing something in the future when, you know, both of us at the moment, then obviously with we talked about it before COVID. And then all that happened and put paid to absolutely everything. But it would be so lovely just to get, you know, go out and do those songs live. I think it'd be great fun. And you might be in luck, actually, because uh, there is going to be a sonic symphony that's happening around the world that Sega has commissioned. Uh, it started with just being an online thing, but they did a yeah. show in Brazil and it has like a big orchestra and everything. And there's little rumours that uh, one of the bands, uh, I actually interviewed the vocalist of a Johnny Giuelli of Crush 40. They did a lot of other Sonic songs as well. Yeah. There's a lot of rumours that they're going to be at it. And I also spoke about it to one of the other vocalists uh, who worked on Sonic Frontiers, Mary Kirk Holmes. And they said, yeah, I'd be up to singing in that too. So if you were given the chance to sing at the Sonic Symphony, would you take it? Oh my goodness, singing with an orchestra. <gasps> I would just be, honestly, I'd be there. Absolutely. So yeah, if they want to get, I, may, I need to get in touch with them actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be great. I'd love it. Absolutely love it. That would be amazing to do. Oh yeah, that, that'd be great fun. I'm sure like the fans would love it if like, you know, you came back to do it again and sing all the live stuff again, because I yeah. think, I think you'd only done it uh, once or twice, I believe. We have. We did. Um, there was a convention in, oh, was it 2007, maybe? I think. Yeah. I think it was 2000, so 2006, 2007 in London. And then on um, Richard and I did a thing by candlelight. There was a couple of songs just by piano. And we did a couple of the songs then. But I can't remember when that was. That was a long time ago, though. Yeah, I see. I see. But yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great if uh, if they could got, get you into the Sonic Symphony, especially if they're if they're going to like London or somewhere in England. I mean, there's no excuse. Like, no. they, they gotta bring you on. <laughs> oh God, I really hope so. I'm gonna have to look into that and just see what they're doing because that would that would be yeah, I'd love to do it. So if uh, Sega are listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know who's a call <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and uh what was actually like your favorite of the songs that you sung in like sonic r like ones that i particularly would like like a, a lot of fans would like would be like obviously supersonic racing can you feel the sunshine 
work it out another great one as well what does i particularly like would be living in the city and number one because they're very different yeah, as well what about you living, i was about to say living in the city that was a really it was a personal favorite but i have to say i mean no seeing people and what can you feel the sunshine means to people that has become a bit of a favorite for me i actually over lockdown and um, one of the there was a sonic fan that um said it's my birthday and I'd love you to sing. Would you think about doing a video and sing happy birthday to me just on, on Twitter? And I thought, yeah. And I, I sang a bit of Can You Feel the Sunshine for him as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, oh. um, and that, you know, it was it was quite good fun. I did quite a lot of um, podcasts and interviews and things over lockdown, which was which was quite nice because you just interact with people. And it was nice to I'm, I'm quite amazed at how what the following is still like for it it's just huge and it's so nice everybody's so everybody I speak to is just so lovely and they've got fabulous memories of it all um but yes I'd say those two really probably stood out for me um but can you feel the sunshine is just great because it means so much to a lot of people yeah yeah and it's like it's it's the first song that you hear in the game you start on the first level that's like uh, the first like full track you end up hearing in the game so it would it, it, it was the first like exposure to, yeah. to to your voice and to the music and the style of the game in general. Yeah. Um, and uh, have you ever actually played Sonic R at all? Have you ever tried it? And <laughs> I get asked that all the time. Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> my my brother my brother's the gamer, and he he couldn't believe it when I got the job because he was like, "Oh my god, you jammy sod!" Because he knew that I'd be I'd be going I'd be going to like you know all these different sort of gaming conventions and different things or parties. You know when they'd come over and they'd have some sort of do. I I got invited to, which was really lovely. Um, but um, but yeah, no, he just thought it was really funny because it was something that I wasn't you know. I I'm, I'm, didn't play the games really, but I do think I should. I, I remember somebody once saying on an interview, one of the fans just said, I just actually ruined his whole childhood. <laughs> <laughs> because I said I never played the games and I thought, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't feel too bad about it because a lot of the people that I've interviewed, uh, like a lot of the people that worked on games, most of them have never played a single game. No. No. I don't know. Or they maybe have played like one, like I remember one guy I interviewed named Eric Kelso. He did like, uh, he voice acted in a video game that you could, you could, it was in like an arcade. So you could go into an arcade, you pay a, a bit of money and then play it. So what he did was he went into the arcade, he found the game he was in, put a bit of money in, and he played as far as just to hear his voice. And then since he sucked, he just let himself die and then just walk off. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny actually i would somebody once said to me um how do you how do you feel about some some people um, some of the fans have said they quite like the game but they they just have to turn the music off and i <laughs> What do, you, what do you actually want me to say to that, really? I don't know what to say. And then I've had the other side of it where people have said, oh, my God, the best bit about the game is the music. So, you know. But I suppose I should, um, I, I have it, I have the game, but unfortunately I didn't have the console to play it on. No, no. So. No, no, and, and, and uh, it'd be harder now to find because the Saturn was like one of the Sega's like most failed consoles. It would be up there with the Dreamcast. So like there's actually le less of them out there because yeah. of that. And there was less games for it as well. Um, Sonic R was actually the only original Sonic game that came out on that system. Yeah. No, it was it was great. And then we did another one after as well. We had um, Metropolis Street Racer as well, which was great fun. But we were then in Sega building. Um, Richard had built a studio in there. So we actually did all that one in the actual building itself. So we weren't we weren't having our dinner made every day by uh, in the lovely studio that we were in. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the Sega offices doing these songs. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was going to actually ask you about Metropolis Street Racer as well. I will not ask you the question of, uh, oh, did you play the game? Because I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> but um, uh, one thing I would like to ask you about it is that uh, you actually went on that soundtrack as 
Helena Davidson. So uh, how did that come about? Because I believe that had to do Crazy. with some... So, so I had to pick a different name because at the time I'd just signed a record deal where I was fronting a band called Shiva and they thought there might be a bit of a conflict of interest and it was just about to do Metropolis Street Racer and they had my name that I was going out to front this 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 band. Um, and so we, we had a chat about it and I said, well, how about I go under some sort of pseudonym pseudonym <laughs> and I, I picked Helena because Helen is a, a, a confirmation name of mine and then just Davidson we just added a little bit um, to the end but it, it honestly I don't even know why I look back now and think why on earth did we do that it was one of those things that everybody was a little bit precious about stuff at the time I didn't care but the record company were being a little bit well conflict of in you doing this Honestly, now nobody would care, but it was a bit of a strange thing at the time, and I just I just went along with it really. But everybody knew it was me anyway, yeah. So it made no difference. No idea, no <laughs> idea why I did that. <laughs> I think I was just going along with what they thought at the time. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I I tend to find that that still is the case because like I, I've spoken to like some younger up and coming artists and like you'll you'll find that like oh their record label isn't happy doing this or that or the other and they'll either yeah. have to decline it ultimately or do like uh, maybe like a pseudo name or something i hear that a lot it's um i sort of was hoping that that might have changed a little bit in the music industry but obviously not you know it's a little bit pretentious isn't it really and, uh, it's uh, ridiculous yeah <laughs> <laughs> really and truly. Yeah, no, very silly. Ah, it is totally, totally. And um, uh, going back actually to Metropolis Street Racer and less to um, uh, record label nonsense, <laughs> uh, there's two songs in the game that I actually really like because they're very different. They weren't like, um, there was a lot of songs in the game that were similar to Sonic R, but these two I found were a little different. That was Don't Wait and I Can Still Believe. Um, can you talk to me about uh, recording those songs? Because they were a little more rock-esque, I, I tend to find, especially Don't Wait. I, I, I Can Still Believe is probably my my favourite off there. It was just lovely. It was a proper, because um, I'm quite poppy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it was just lovely to sing. And it was one that just stuck in my head as well, because it's got a great hook. It's a great song. Um, don't Wait. I don't, I'll be honest, right now I don't remember that one. I'd have to listen to them. Uh, but I can still believe I do. I did actually sing it for uh, on a radio, um, an interview I did um, a, a few years back. Somebody asked me if I'd just sing a little bit of it. And thankfully I remembered remembered it as well. It's a long time ago. <laughs> but don't wait. I'm, I was it quite rocky? Was it a, a rockier one? Yeah, it was the it was the heaviest of the the ones that you did. It was like yeah. it was it was more of a rock sort of sounding song. Uh, I don't remember what the lyrics were. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. No, this I mean because they were all in different styles, weren't they? So we were trying for different radio stations, and we were trying to do you know something. And I found it harder actually doing Metropolis Street Racer than I did Sonic. Because Sonic was very much, I knew exactly what we, we needed to do. We, we even had the game running at the side of us, so I could see how punchy I needed to be. So let's just say I went in one day and my voice was a bit tired. Um, you could tell, you know, we'd have to think about, now think about this mad hedgehog running around everywhere and, you know, crazed. You've got to get that power and that sort of sense of urgency in, in your voice. So we'd have a break and, you know, we'd leave it for a little bit and I'd go back because it had to be very, very punchy to go with the thing. And it helped seeing this little thing run, run, run around <laughs> at the side of me while I was singing as well. So Surely you tried the game when you saw it, like, right in front of you. Surely you thought, <laughs> maybe I'll give it a go and see how there good... But there wasn't, the, there wasn't the opportunity, really. That is my excuse. There wasn't the... They just had the video of it. So there wasn't ah, actually right. a games console. That wasn't there. I promise you. I'm not just making excuses. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, did your brother at least play? Because you, you said that your, your brother is a gamer. Did he have a go at it? And if so, what did he think of it? Sorry, he had a PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> he's too busy playing gran turismo not sonic r <laughs> and also there is absolutely no way that my brother would want my vocals in his ear while he's playing a game there's a, he would have turned it off he would have been one of those people that would actually have turned my vocal off so there you go 
A savage brother. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's move on away from all the uh, the Sonic R and Metropolis Street Racer stuff because we, we, we yeah. delved into practically everything for it. And I thank you for it because the fans are going to love it. They're going to be like, yes, all the Sonic R stuff. Um, but you have done a little bit more than that. One thing that you did mention around the time was the band D-Ream. You were part of like, uh, working with them on certain songs and uh, gigs and stuff. Uh, what was it yeah. like uh, working with them, actually? Brilliant. I mean, that I I went. So it was after after the um, sort of couple of tours with Gary, and then I did I did a few little bits and pieces in between, and then the audition came up for D Ream. I knew I'd seen them on TV, and I listened to the the song "You're the Best Thing" and just thought, oh, God, I want to sing that song so much. And then I heard that they were auditioning for new girls for their Australian tour. So I just went down to the re rehearsal studios and just said, look, I want to audition and stayed there until they saw me um, and thankfully got the job and went and my first big gigs with them was straight on an Australian tour, which was just amazing. We were out there for about three weeks, then came back and there was because they were riding high over the off the first album. Things had already been number one um and there were loads of tvs we were doing a university tour then we did our own tour and um and then it was straight into the second album um i loved it and i still do and over lockdown um pete and al um the uh, you know the original two um were writing a new album so um pete's in ireland al's in birmingham i'm down south um and i got a obviously because of lockdown we couldn't get together so they'd send me files and send me the stuff and i'd go down to a friend who's got a studio down here and just record my vocals and send them over to ireland for them to mix and that's how we did it and we even did two videos like that as well where i was just at home with my daughter filming me just on next to a wall just filming little <laughs> bits that for the video you know you see the, the video for many hands and that's how we had to do it because we were in the middle of a lockdown and they they filmed it they, they did a great job of filming it putting it all together um and then as soon as we could we we started out again last year just doing festivals and um gigs they they've um they they've been writing new stuff at the moment they've got a song called pedestal which has just been in the vintage chart it's got to number one nice um and uh we've got uh, festivals coming up and we're just hoping about uh, and a possible tour towards the end of the year as well which because I, I love i love doing the d ream songs you know they're great writers pete's a fantastic melody writer lyricist everything so it's good fun Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, as well with D-Ream, you also got to appear on Top of the Pops, the big, the big <laughs> program there. Now, I'd love to yeah. speak to you about that because I've spoken to many people about Top of the Pops and their mixed experience of it. I, I tend to find there's uh, highs and lows of it. But uh, uh, what, what was your experience on Top of the Pops? What was it like uh, being on such a well, big show like that? The first one I did... Um, it was so I joined D Ream around about the August August time of ninety four, and then my first top of the pops was we were recording the Christmas top of the pops and take that were presenting, and I was just I was so excited it was ridiculous I just couldn't wait and I remember being stood in this room looking around thinking my God this is so small it's such a small studio from what what you see out there it always looks so big you know there's only just like four stages you know all facing each other. Um, but I absolutely loved it. It was my first one. I just had a ball, you know, and we went over to the the bar at the studios later and all the EastEnders lot came in and joined us for a drink. And it was just great. You all just sat there having a good time. Um, and then we did a few of them. And then obviously we also did the, um, we, we were back doing uh, Top of the Pots with the Labour Party, obviously with all the, the things can only get better during all that as well. So we were back doing Top of the Pops on the day, on the day of the election when Tony Blair got in. So that was quite a celebration again as well. Oh, that's mad. So, yeah, it was good times anyway on Top of the Pops. <laughs> good experience. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you'd just be, you know, you'd be having your makeup done with, E17 or somebody or <laughs> somebody in you think this is a little bit mad you you're just all in different rooms and coming in and out of rooms everybody's chatting to each other and it was just really good fun it really good 
Yeah, yeah, and um, as well as that, like, um, the, the whole thing about Top of the Pops was that, like, uh, around that time especially, was that uh, the singers had to do it live, but the guitarists and the keyboard players, they weren't allowed to do it live. That's right. Since you were a backing vocalist, were you singing live or were you dubbed? No. No, some of the some of the TVs we did, we did a lot, a lot of MTV acoustic um, bits during that time. That was all live, but with then the musicians would be live as well. But Top of the Pops, from what I remember, no. So, some of the TVs we did uh, were we would sing live, but a lot of it was just miming. Yeah, but lead singer not. Pete used to always sing it live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can I can tell. Well, there there. That's a that's an interesting little uh, thing to point out there because. Uh, I didn't know. I I knew that the the, the vo one of the lead vocalists had to sing. I didn't know it was only one. I didn't know. I I thought like I think, maybe. I think it all depends on um how it's set up because I did a actually the whole thing would have been live. I did um backing vocals as well on uh, Tom Jones and Stereophonics when they did Mama Told Me Not to Come, oh. and the whole thing we did Top of the Pops a couple of times. The whole thing was live. So I think it all depends. They, they'd they have these live um, every now and then everything. The whole bands would be live and everything. But from what I remember, I don't think with D-Ream I did. Um, no, I don't think so. Hmm, interesting. And what was it like uh, working with Tom Jones, of all people? I mean, like, big, big, big name artist there. Ah, oh, lovely. Lovely, lovely Tom. So unflappable. He's just one of these people that's just cool. He's just cool. That's all you can say about Tom, really. He just doesn't get... He just doesn't get bothered about anything. Total professional. And I remember when I first met him, he said he came over and he said, "Hello, TJ. My name's TJ too." <laughs> and I just giggled like a little schoolgirl, embarrassed myself. But that was yeah, it was great fun. And Stereophonics, obviously, massive band, just totally brilliant as well. So that was it was good fun. Oh yeah, yeah, great. That that sounds absolutely cool. Really cool. And another cool band is ABBA, and you happen to be a part of one of the biggest <laughs> tribute bands, Bjorn Again. I w I was for for a long time actually. Yes, we I, we've got our own now. We still do it. We've um um we're all uh, there's a few of those ex Bjorn Again members. We decided to get our own thing together quite about ten years ago now actually. Um, and we we perform Sweden, Norway, everywhere. Really weird. We do so. We did. A, we've just come, done a five week tour of Sweden, which is mad <laughs> it, when you think about it. Um, but um, yes, we do quite a few big theatres here. But then we take it over to Scandinavia quite a bit as well. But we're all still in. You know, it's all very amicable. We still know Beyond Again really well, and and everything. So we're all we're all mates. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. But yeah, um, you you did like as you mentioned, you performed in Norway and everything uh, with these Abbott tribute bands. But uh, yeah. one one I noticed uh, that you performed in was. Uh, with Bjorn again, actually, was the Royal Albert Hall, which like a big, big venue yeah, that amazing. is, like a big crowd as well. So like, what was it's it like amazing. performing to an audience with a couple of thousand looking at you? It was, I mean, because also I had everybody I think I knew came to that gig as well. So I was nervous as hell. It was amazing gig. It was absolutely fantastic. It, it seemed to go in a bit of a blur because we've been there all day filming lots of little bits to go on the video as well because we were recording the whole thing and we were releasing a video and a, a, a CD of it at the time. Um, and so it just seemed a little bit, you know, there was so much to think about. And we all came off stage, backstage and sat there in the dressing room and went, oh, God, did, did they, do you think they enjoyed it? Because the, because the Albert Hall is so, it's massive, but it just, you don't know what you're getting back. I, I wasn't sure. It looked like everybody was enjoying it. And so we came out of the dressing room, we went into one of the big rooms where there's big, big after show party and everybody was, we walked in, just went mad. And we thought, oh, OK, they enjoyed it. That was a good that was a good night. Um, but yeah, it was just to be able to play the Albert Hall singing those songs. My God, what a dream come true, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. Like who, who wouldn't want to perform at a stage like that massive as well? Um, but uh, yeah. speaking about um, not knowing if the audience liked and stuff, were, were you sort of like blanking out the audience when um, you when performing? Because I tend to find whenever I've been was, on a stage, I think I think the biggest thing is it's really funny actually. An intimate gig when you've got a smaller audience, you get more. 
in a way you get more back off it because you can hear everybody when you do a massive show you're, you're so far removed from the audience um, sometimes in certain places, you just because of the just the nature of the venue, you can't hear it in the same way. It's the same when you know I'm gonna name drop here when we supported the Spice Girls. We, what we did, <laughs> we did? Yeah, we supported Spice Girls in '98 with Beyond Again. She and we did. Uh, I got to say hello, Wembley. You know, I'm just <laughs> so happy. <laughs> but but I that. Again, I just couldn't. You couldn't hear anything because you're so far away from every, everybody, and and you're just taking it all in, really, and just can't actually quite believe that you're on a stage like that. Um, but it it was still, you know, looking back on it, I'm just so pleased I got a chance to do things like that. I just feel very grateful. Gee, and what what was it like performing in Wembley? That must have been something else. Now that must it have been was. a great gig. Oh, it was. It was just fantastic. I mean, they were just, you know, to be able to have. We did two, two days at two days at Wembley Stadium, and then we did Sheffield. Um, oh, what's the big Sheffield Stadium called? I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and yeah, it was fantastic. We only did, I think, we did about half an hour because we were just the support slot. Um, and but it was great just great to do it really oh yeah totally especially to, to like a, a you know an arena like that with however countless amount of people watching you it must have been yeah must have been an experience that's for sure yeah no it was it was great really good i'm guessing the audience was uh, even more of a blur on that gig yeah definitely uh, it was um i mean we've had some though we've had some near misses with stuff I mean, with them um, beyond again we uh, we were doing um the Ajax Stadium in Holland, which is, I think it's about 80,000. And they were doing, it was the beginning of their, it was the Olympics, it was an Olympic thing. And we um, we found out just as we got there, were there only three of us there, the blonde, Agneta, which obviously you can't go on stage without Agneta. She, her plane had been delayed, her flight had been delayed coming in. Oh. And we were there and we were going on first to open up the, the whole thing. And we said, we can't, we haven't got, they said, you're going to have to, it's being televised, you're going to have to go on. And we had to walk from the side all the way into the centre of the whole stadium. And you could hear people looking around thinking, why is there only one girl? Why, where's, where's Agneta? And I had to start without her. I did about four songs on my own before all of a sudden, and she'd had a police escort from the airport. They sent a police escort. She had to get put her costume on in the back of the police car oh my to get gosh. to the stadium. And then halfway through, she ran on stage to come and join me and then joined in. So <laughs> that was a bit hairy. I was there running around. I remember just running around trying to do both parts and trying to make it look as if this is how it was we were supposed to be doing this. They wouldn't let us change the slot. Oh, my God. But that was a bit mad. That was a bit crazy. And, and that was televised as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. God! <laughs> yeah. So I literally went out on my own with the two guys, um, you know, Benny and Bjorn, and went, uh, just me, and that was it. And waiting for Agneta to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> God knows why they didn't let us switch. That would have made perfect sense, but no. Anyway. Ah. Oh well. Yeah. But uh, uh, since you said that it's uh, tele that was televised at the time, have you been able to find any footage of that TV and recording? Do you know and what? So I've never looked. I've never looked for it. <laughs> you probably should. <laughs> yeah, maybe should because at the time that's true. Actually, I don't know whether it would be maybe it would be on YouTube or something. I don't know. Uh, but I haven't actually looked for that one, so maybe I should have a look to see if I can find it. Yeah, you probably you probably should because like uh, it's like. Uh, it's like one of those, like, I believe you now, but, like, it's almost, like, too good to be true how perfectly wrong it went to the first part. Yeah. But why would you not? You know, if, if a band is known for the four members of the band, why would you not? They just said, no, we can't change the... And I don't know whether other artists were saying, well, I can't go on, I'm not doing it, I'm not... I don't know, I've no idea. But the fact that they wouldn't let us switch round is quite funny. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, that, that's, that's just weird. The, the, we'll, we'll never know the answer, that's for no, sure. No, 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 never know the answer. <laughs> uh, now, let's go on to some of your more uh, solo work, uh, a little similar to the, uh, to the Sonic R stuff, but a little different. 
because uh, he ended up doing a bit of collaborations as a solo artist. One actually with Sash, of all people, uh, for pre performing uh, their song, I Believe. So uh, what was it like working with Sash on that? Well, that, that came off the back of uh, my own single, Wonderful Life. Uh, they'd heard that and they asked me to um, guest on their, their album. First of all, I went over to Germany to record two songs for the album. And then they said they were going to release, I believe, as a single. And they said, would you come out to um, Egypt to film? I said, absolutely. Yes, of course. And I was in the middle of a, the tour with Bjorn again at the time. And I, I went out there with my mate who sort of acted as my tour manager. So I could have somebody with me, really. And um, we actually filmed. We were the first, I think it was the first time they'd filmed a video in a, in a pyramid um, in the middle of the desert. And it that was just amazing in its on itself. It was just fantastic. Um, um, but yeah, no, I, I didn't really because the, the the sash is made up of there's three guys and the two producers. I I met them first in the studio, so I didn't actually meet Sash himself until we were filming the video. <laughs> so um, that's the first time I'd met him, which was quite funny. But I don't think it got it's, it's a shame really because I don't think it got released in the UK. The single, I think it just got released in Germany in the end. Yeah, yeah, because I was checking the charts and I didn't see any UK charts or even no. Ireland charts. I saw nothing. It was just, I think it was in the German charts and not, uh, somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think so. It was just, uh, yeah, it was just over in uh, in Germany and, Europe, well, maybe the rest of Europe as well. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, which which does, does, does suck. But you did go to Egypt anyway, and you had like a like. I mean, what was it like? Like seeing like the pyramids of Giza and all these like Amazing. ancient wonders. I know it was it was fantastic actually. Um, it was also quite funny because we were doing we were for, um getting prep prep for the video, um, but it was Ramadan and they had to stop to eat in as in the evenings, and there was a sense of urgency that everything you know you had to stop to make sure everybody had a rest because that was part of you know the thing and i just remember it, everything got very hectic towards the end because they had to be ready to have a break before we filmed in the evening because that you know that's that was part of uh, ramadan and i just remember thinking oh my goodness i wonder whether they're going to bring we were in the middle of the desert and i'm just very excited about the sort of food that was going to maybe come out that we're all going to sit and eat and all of a sudden, these pizza vans just arrived in the middle of the desert. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay, we're having pizza. <laughs> it's like, oh, gosh, I was getting all excited about an Egyptian buffet or something. But, yeah, pizza. Yeah. But it, was, it was great. Um, the only thing, a bit, bit of a I'm sort of, this is actually on my website, so I'm not actually divulging any new information here, but I am... Um, I think I got um, bitten by, uh, or I got a little tick or something from one of the camels. There were lots of camels and stray dogs around. Um, I ended up with awful uh, ringworm um, all the way. It's like a rash that you get everywhere. So when I got back to the UK, it started off as a tiny little bit and, and it literally started covering. I looked like I was covered in scales. Oh. So, and that took about three months to actually disappear. So that was my awful ending of my <laughs> life in Egypt. But I, they think that's where it came from. I just picked up some sort of little bite or something that triggered a, um, a ringworm. Is like a just it literally is like a rings on your skin. Um, and when you're performing, as you can imagine, I was having to put lots of makeup everywhere just to try and cover it all up. Yeah, that was horrible. But there you go. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine but the glamour side of the music industry. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, I could, I can imagine. Yeah, you, 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 you must have gotten it in Egypt, because like, especially if there was all camels and everything, and they had like infections and stuff. Because yeah, but they think I probably just picked something up, like a little tick or something, a little bug, um, that that had that reaction on my skin. But there you go. I'll probably never know. Yeah, another answer that we'll never know. We'll never get the. <laughs> Oh, we're having we're having we're having a bit too much of those. Uh, but uh, uh, you also had some other singles as well. Uh, you did mention about Wonderful Life, and you also had another yeah. one called Brilliant Feeling. Both just got into the UK charts. No number one hits or anything, but they just got in. So, uh, what was it like, anyways, having like two songs at least 
just get into the UK singles charts. I know it was a shame, really. With a wonderful life, I think was it kept getting put back, and it was it got released. I think about a week or two weeks before Christmas, because and that's not the best of times. I'm not making excuses, but you know it's a bit of a shame because I'd done an awful lot of promo. We'd done the Smash Hits Awards. We I'd been on tour with the Smash Hits thing. Um, brilliant feeling. Um, I know that it did really well in Australia, but again, I don't think it really sort of did that much here. Um, but it became quite a good dance anthem out in Australia. So it's a shame, actually. That would have been great to go out there and, and promote that song. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they did OK. And as a new artist, I suppose, nobody knew, you know, who I was really. Um, it was nice just to even chart. So I was quite happy with that anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of artists who would at least wish to be at least have their name in the charts for at least one thing. So at least you yeah. did get to do that. And it was yeah, it was a good yeah. rendition of a wonderful life as well. It was a very like dancier version, just a very yeah. well. It was Ian Van Dahl's version that got um, released. We did a we did a laid back more of a more of a laid back version that we've got. But I now think that is now out on on YouTube. Somebody has actually put it out there. Hmm. I mean, it's amazing what I, I there's th stuff on YouTube that I didn't even know that even got released. Some of the things <laughs> I've, I've heard, I've heard remixes of things or somebody said, Oh, is that you singing on? And I've gone, Oh, and I've had a quick look and think, Oh yeah, God, I remember that one. But um, yeah, quite a lot of stuff out there. So whoever's, whoever's finding all these songs out that I've done in the past, it's like, well done. Cause I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, speaking of like remixes of songs that you uh, appeared on on anything, have you ever heard any of the remixes, whether they be unofficial or official of the Sonic R stuff, like the supersonic racing stuff? Yeah, I have. And it's, it's really funny actually, cause quite a few people have asked me, I get quite a, um, a lot of uh, traffic through my website still just asking what you know why can't i buy these songs why can't i download them on something sega never released them as a, a single there's never a, a singles or albums or anything it's only off the game and it's a bit it's a bit of a shame really because it would be nice i think to actually have a have a soundtrack that was separate that people could actually have because there's all this stuff me people put everything out everywhere but there's never been an actual album released well, so, have I got some good news for you? There has been for about eight years on Spotify. Oh my goodness! Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been out for eight years on Spotify. Uh, your vocals on it, the original tracks. Well, the actual, so the actual, out uh, the Sonic, well, the the Sonic R soundtrack, entire thing, including instrumentals and jingles and and by and that's by Sega. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Well, there, there you go. There you go. Uh, better uh, eight years late than never knowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there, there you go. There you go. And uh, derailing back from uh, Sonic R again and uh, going back to your, uh, your other music, um, ha have you ever like uh, performed with uh, any other people that uh, I haven't mentioned or uh, played in any other venues that we haven't covered? Uh trying to think actually i mean back you know I, oh last year actually i um i a bit of a dream come true i got to work with um holly johnson from frankie goes to hollywood oh and i did uh, a few shows with him um and um i did forever young festival in ireland oh which i think it's just outside of dublin tj that's like a couple of minutes from where i live i could have went I didn't go. <laughs> we were we were headlining as well. It was amazing. It was such a fantastic festival. Oh my god, I loved it. But also getting to sing stuff like Relax and Two Tribes and all those songs. I was back to being that 16-year-old buying Relax and getting, getting it home thinking, oh, I'm not supposed to be playing this because it's been banned. <laughs> and meeting Holly, oh, my God, you know, what, what a brilliant, brilliant bloke. He's just so great. Um, that was lovely. But, yeah, just over the years, I think there's um, recently um, I did put on Twitter, actually, because Burt Bacharach passing away, I did a fabulous tribute to Burt Bacharach um, back in, I think it was 2000, and I was on backing vocals for all these different artists that came in, and that was, um, that yeah, that that was great, great fun to do all those songs, 
He had so many different artists come in from Dionne Warwick to Bob Geldof to Leo Sayer to loads of, you know, different people over the years. And um, that that was great fun. That was really nice to do that. Yeah, yeah. And are you going back to do Forever Young this year? Because, like, I'll go. <laughs> I don't think we are, you know. I don't, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I, 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 I think I did. I see the lineup. I don't think so. No, but it's it's a lovely, lovely festival. It really, really is nice. Actually, it's one of the one of the best ones to be. Just even a like, musician backstage with everything that how it's run, everything that they do. It was just so good. It was so good to be part of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I bet I, if if you're back uh, at it, let me know because I'll definitely I'll I'll pop over and see see the gig for sure. Yes, definitely. And uh, I mean, like uh, other. I suppose that probably the, the best question to sort of uh, wrap things up here is uh, sort of what are your plans for the, the future? Are you going to release uh, more new music, uh, anything up, up and coming? I'd like to. I started dabbling around a little bit during lockdown and haven't really sort of done anything much with it since. I, I'm, I'm more a live person rather than a studio person. However, I just know that it is time to get more down on on you know go go into a studio do some more writing and recording which i used to do anyway um but um but yeah i i, I, I to be honest for me i just love singing and now that we're allowed to do more live music again i i like to do my own little gigs down where i live down on the south coast um and then hopefully you know the next few few months is going to be busy with Dream back again there's a few ABBA shows coming in um and you just never know for for other things at the moment I'm just you know see what happens really and obviously I now need to get in touch with Sega about being on stage do it with the symphony orchestra oh yes <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be great crack that would be great wow, crack to see that, that that would be amazing that would be fantastic definitely oh yeah without a doubt with without a doubt well, TJ, look, it's been great having you on. We could go on thank all day, you. but uh, we got to end it somewhere. So, TJ, thank you so much for coming on, You're doing the welcome. interview. Is it's there any sort fun. of last things you'd like to say? And uh, would you like to plug in any of the old socials? Um, just come and say hello to me on Twitter at Teresa Jane Davis. Um, I'm, I'm always, you know, I always answer every, everything. So, you know, just come and say hello, really. <laughs> all right. And you can find me simply on my YouTube channel, Jack Lucas Caffrey. You may already be there if you're watching this interview on YouTube. But, Teresa Jane Davis, thank you very much for coming on. Thank and, you. And, uh, yeah, speak to you soon. <laughs> <laughs>